You're listening to The Unsafe Bible with Pastor Ken Brown. As we see God doing everything that He's doing around us today, in these last days, do we agree with Him about the sin and that He's moving against it? Do we truly agree with Him, or do we find ourselves sometimes going, really? Do we need to go there? But God is judging. He says that in the last days, He's going to judge planet Earth. All the signs around us today point to something that is a trend, and it's accelerating, and it's accelerating towards something. Those who are not in Christ will receive His judgment. Today, Pastor Ken extends the invitation to receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Tomorrow might be too late. The Bible constantly proclaims, Repent, for the kingdom is coming. Choose this day to turn from your sins and acknowledge your need for Jesus as your Savior. He will extend His judgment upon the earth one day soon and to all who have not put their trust in Him. Pastor Ken urges you to answer the invitation to Jesus today. Well, let's join Pastor Ken in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 21, as he continues his message, What Judgment Looks Like. What was Ezekiel promised as an audience when he first began his ministry? What did God tell him about the kinds of people who would be listening to him? In chapter 2, remember back in verse 4, I'm sending you to them who are stubborn and obstinate children. That's a great congregation right there. And you shall say to them, thus says the Lord God. And for them, whether they listen or not, for they're rebellious, they will know that a prophet's been among them. And you, son of man, neither fear them nor fear their words, though thistles and thorns are with you and you sit on scorpions. Neither fear their words nor be dismayed at their presence, for they are a rebellious house. You shall speak my words to them, whether they listen or not, for they are rebellious. But they asked very clearly, don't speak in parables anymore. That's all you do is speak in parables. Be careful what you ask for. Because after that, he starts talking directly. In chapter 21, it is direct. There's no parable. He starts talk, God starts talking through Ezekiel directly without a parable. God had already provided numerous explanations to the people. They, and he also had told Ezekiel, they're not going to listen to you. He just told Ezekiel basically what it says in Proverbs chapter 3, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, and all your ways acknowledge Him, He'll make you pass straight. Don't worry about it. I got it handled. Unlike Jeremiah who had to be recommissioned and Isaiah who had to be recommissioned, Ezekiel never had to be recommissioned. He continued on with this initial ministry that he was given by the Lord. So chapter 21, first seven verses, and the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face toward Jerusalem, and speak against the sanctuaries and prophesy against the land of Israel, and say to the land of Israel, thus says the Lord, behold, I'm against you. I will draw my sword out of its sheath and cut off from you the righteous and the wicked. He's not, not talking about trees anymore. You notice that? Because I will cut, therefore my sword will go forth from its sheath against all flesh from south to north. Thus all flesh will know that I, the Lord, have drawn my sword out of its sheath. It will not return to its sheath again. As for you, son of man, groan with breaking heart and bitter grief, groan in their sight. And when they say to you, why do you groan? You shall say, because of the news that is coming, and every heart will melt, all hands will be feeble, every spirit will faint, and all knees will be weak as water. Behold, it comes, and it will happen, declares the Lord God. He mentions the word sword 19 times in this chapter. Again, don't talk to us in parables anymore, Ezekiel. Great, not a problem. Sword, 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 sword. It'd be, I mean, it'd be the same thing today. Assault rifle, assault rifle, assault, AR-15, 9 millimeter, whatever you want to use your term. He quits using the terms that, trying to make them understand. He's speaking plainly to them now. And every time he says sword, it's a reference to the Babylonian army. That's what he's talking about. And we see that Ezekiel is to prophesy here at the beginning of chapter 21 to three specific targets. That's what he's talking about. Target number one is Jerusalem. That is the target. He is speaking specifically to, and turning towards Jerusalem, st- sitting in his room, turns towards Jerusalem. He's speaking to Jerusalem, target one. Target two, the temple. Yeah, he's, he's speaking against the sanctuary. So he talks towards Jerusalem, then he speaks against the temple and the entire land of Judah. So it's the whole land that he's teaching against. And he is to prophesy against. 
not four. This is not good stuff that they want to hear. In verse 3, God makes it clear that He is the one using the Babylonians. He makes it clear by saying He is drawing out His sword. He's not saying I'm bringing them in, I'm luring them in. He's saying I'm pulling the sword out of the sheath, the Babylonians are the, sh- are the sword, I'm using them. Holiness of places has no privilege. You know, just because they have the temple doesn't mean they're protected. Because unholy people aren't going to be protected simply because there's a holy place for them to run into. It's not going to happen. Sanctuaries are no protection against divine justice. Back in verse 49, by the way, remember, again, Ezekiel was, was told, don't speak in Proverbs to us anymore. Be careful what you ask for. Because what we see here in chapter 21 is one of the most graphic chapters in the entire Bible on the judgment of God. Yahweh's sword is personified, and God's attitude of judgment is heightened. In verse 49, it says MT, 21.5. That's the Masoretic text. So if you're reading the Hebrew text, chapter 21 is already five verses into it at chapter 20, verse 49. The leadership in exile says, don't speak to us in parables anymore. So Ezekiel is graphically describing the judgment on Jerusalem. They're hearing it. They're going to hear it without any pictures anymore. But literally, what he's saying is that everyone, good and bad, are going to be cut off, has been indicated in the parable of the green and dry tree back in chapter 20. The work was to begin from the south, so literally they're going to attack from the Negev, moving north and go northward. And it implies that Ezekiel expected Nebuchadnezzar maybe to attack Egypt first and then and move north. It doesn't matter. He did literally start from the south and move north. Uh, the, the statement, it shall not return but to its sheath, means... Uh, it's not going to be over with until Babylon has completed everything that God wants them to complete. It's, they're not going home again. There's not going to be a fourth time. They're going to come, this is the third time they're showing up. They're not going back until they're done. To drive the point home, Ezekiel is asked of the Lord to provide physicality to the message. Remember, Ezekiel is the play actor of prophets. He's giving all these things that he's supposed to do. So he is to show excessive grief in the style of the Middle East. So here he is, he gives this message and he starts wailing and howling just like someone who has lost a loved one in the Middle East has. He's crying and they don't understand what's going on. And that's what he's doing. This performance that he's doing, he's doing the nonverbal groaning, it expresses deep pain and grief in the Middle East. That's what it does. It was first to get everybody's attention, he's talking and all of a sudden he starts doing that and they're going, now what's wrong with this guy? Uh, And it arouses curiosity. And they demand an explanation in verse 7. And and you can tell, they say, well, when they say, why do you groan? Well, it indicates that at least their limited objective was achieved. But Ezekiel's answer to their question raises the significance of this act to another level. His, His reaction is that it's a report that he's received. He does not describe the events. He focuses on the effect of the report to those who who actually receive it. He's going to let the people know that they will suffer from total emotional and mental turmoil over what they take place, what they're going to hear takes place. There's also going to be physical manifestations in the folks in captivity over a result of what they hear. There's going to be weakness and lack of physical control over bodily elimination. I'm trying to be nice here, but what it says in verse 7, literally, is why, because of the news that is coming, every heart will melt, all hands will be feeble, weakness, every spirit will faint, the knees will be weak as water. What he's saying is that they're going to be peeing in their pants. Just being honest, that's what he's saying. He's, they're, they're not going to have control of themselves because the news is so bad. Be careful what you ask for when you ask the Lord. Don't talk in parables anymore. Fine, he's being very clear. Verse 8, again the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord, say, A sword, a sword sharpened and also polished, sharpened to make a slaughter, polished to flash like lightning, or shall we rejoice the rod of my son despising every tree? It's to be given, it is given to be polished, that it may be handled. The sword is sharpened and polished to give it into the hand of the slayer, Cry out and wail, son of man, for it is against my people. It is against all the officials of Israel. They are to be delivered over to the sword with my people. Therefore, strike your thigh, for there is a testing. And what if even the rod which despises will be no more, declares the Lord God. 
You, therefore, son of man, prophesy and clap your hands together, and let the sword be doubled the third time, the sword for the slain. It's the sword for the great one slain, which surrounds them that their hearts may melt, and many fall at their gates. I've given the glittering sword. It's made for striking like lightning. It's ripe, wrapped up in readiness for slaughter. Show yourself sharp. Go to the right. Set yourself. Go to the left. Wherever your edge is appointed, I will also clap my hands together and I will appease my wrath. I, the Lord, have spoken. So back to verse 49 of chapter 20. Remember, the elders wanted him to speak plainly. Don't talk in parables. So the Lord is now going to have Ezekiel repeat himself so that it's very clear. The message is really clear. God is judging Jerusalem, period. We went over the indictment several weeks ago, kind of going over what that was all about and covered the horrid spiritual condition of those who were in Jerusalem. Remember they had altars to false gods in the temple. I mean, they weren't worshiping God, they were worshiping everything else. And we talked about the majority, that the majority who went to exile still had this problem. Now there were a whole group that were taken prisoner and were supposed to learn to be members of Nebuchadnezzar's inner circle. How many of those who were captured, and there were probably hundreds who were taken into this, how many of them were faithful and said, don't, let's not eat the king's food to start off with? There's just four guys, Daniel and his three friends. That's it. So not everybody is being faithful. It's just, it's, it's obvious that there's still a problem also with those who are in captivity. So for this prophecy that Ezekiel starts off with, he is going to have a sword in his hand. He's wielding a sword. He's polished it up and he's got the elders in there and he grabs the sword and I'm sure they're very concerned because this madman now has a sword. He said, don't speak in Proverbs anymore and he now is holding a sword. So imagine him starting off this talk by holding up a very polished, very sharpened sword demonstrating how sharp it truly was. Polished and ready to go. So I don't know if he... You know, pulls a hair off of one of the elders and drops it on it and it splits into two as it drops on the sword. I don't know how he does it. But I see him holding the sword trying to get this demonstration. And you start looking at the picture of what he's doing. Remember, he does a lot of his play acting while he's doing the prophecy. So how could the people rejoice since the, it, it says here in the scripture that the rod, the scepter, the symbol of authority of God's representative would not have respect for anyone, despise every tree. Well, it's not talking about God's son. The scepter being talked about here is Nebuchadnezzar. He's the ruler. He's God's ruler. He's God's son as it pertains to judgment. And now that's not unusual. He, he has done that before. He used this kind of description uh, with the northern kingdom back in Isaiah chapter 10 at verse 5, he said, Woe to Assyria, the rod, Neb Babylon's the rod, here Assyria is the rod of his anger and the staff in whose hand is my indignation. I send it against the godly na godless nation and commission it against the people of my fury to capture booty and to, plea to seize plunder to trample them down like mud in the streets. They went overboard and as a result God judged the Assyrians. But here in verse 11, it's almost as if he has polished the sword, prepared it, and has handed it to Nebuchadnezzar. So I mean, literally you could see Ezekiel polishing, getting the sword sharp, and then handing it to someone. You know, saying, I've given my sword to the rod, to the, this person who's going to do the judgment. Starting in verse 12, Ezekiel adds to the demonstration of a highly polished sword, and he starts crying out. So here he is, he talks about the sword, and then he starts wailing, he's crying out and wailing, so, you know, listen to a guy's talking normally and all of a sudden he screams and wails and he starts slapping his thigh. And I mean, that doesn't mean he's, he's into bluegrass music like a lot of people around would be here if you start doing that. It meant something entirely different in that culture. In that culture, slapping your thigh was a sign of mourning. They're listening to him. He's polished a brandished sword. He's yelling and slapping his hand his free hand on his thigh. And the crying out is a sign of despair. It's in judgment. That's a normal thing. We see it in Jeremiah 31, 19. After I turned back, I repented. And after I was instructed, I smote on my thigh. Jeremiah did. I was ashamed and humiliated because I bore the reproach of my youth. It's a sign in, the, in this culture at this time of despair and judgment. When rods of trial, for us, we have a, a rod of trial, it doesn't any, do any good, 
then what happens for the, and they had trods of trial. They had one king after another, and they had one that wanted revival, another one didn't. And they saw the northern kingdom get taken away, and it still didn't work for them. So the rod of trial is not doing well. Now they're going to get a rod of destruction. And when the trying rod has been despised, then comes the despising rod, and that rod doesn't regard young or old, high or low, or, or anybody. So they've basically traded one, one type of judgment for another type of judgment for another type of judgment. So in verse 14, it gets really strange. So here he is, he's, remember, he's standing there, he's got his sword, it's polished, it's ready to go, he's slapping, he's, he's wailing, he's crying, all in this same message, and now he puts the sword down and he starts clapping his hands together in verse 14. Well, what does that mean? He's applauding the judgment of God. That's what he's doing. He's applauding the fact that God is judging the people and doing what he said he was going to do. 2 Kings chapter 11, verse 12, they brought the king's son out, put the crown on him and gave him the testimony and made him king and anointed him and they clapped their hands and said, long live the king. Scripturally, every time we see people clapping their hands together, it's in approvement. It's in, they're approving something that has happened. So, and we'll see this here with Ezekiel applauding and then we're going to see God applauding as well. In Psalm 47, 1, clap your hands, all people. Shout to God with the voice of joy. We're supposed to be applauding the Lord for what he does. And we're worshiping him and praising him. But in that culture, applause, just as it is today, was part and parcel to a- approval of something that was going on. Do you think the elders are a little bit on edge now? This guy has got a sword. They knew he was what he was doing when he slapped his thigh. He wails, he cries, and then he stops and he starts applauding. It's an unusual sermon, would you not say? <laughs> say It's a little bit different. They're on edge. Here's Ezekiel. He's brandishing the sword, wailing in despair over the judgment, striking his thigh in an obvious sign of despair. He stops, either puts the sword down or seethes it, and then he applauds God and approves what, what's happening. As we see God doing everything that he's doing around us today, in these last days, do we agree with him about the sin and that he's moving against it? Do we truly agree with him, or do we find ourselves sometimes going, really? Do we need to go there? But God is judging. He says that in the last days he's going to judge planet Earth. All the signs around us today point to something that is a trend, and it's accelerating, and it's accelerating towards something. In Matthew chapter 24, we talked about this when we studied prophecy, verses 4 to 8, it's part of the Olivet Discourse. Jesus answered and said to them, see to it that no one misleads you. Many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. You'll be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. Well, Ezekiel's telling them, you know, there's no rumor, it's happening. But for, for us in this day and age, we're getting a different message. We're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not frightened, for those things must take place. That's not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And in various places there'll be famines and earthquakes, but all these things are merely the beginnings of birth pangs. Now there's Jewish teachings that say at the time that wars will be stirred up in the world, nation shall be against nation and city against city, saying that that's a time for Messiah to return. Another Jewish source also says, it's, it's the Bereshit Rabbah, says that when you see kingdoms rising against each other, take heed and note the footsteps of the Messiah. The Messiah is soon to come. I mean, that, that's Jewish sources. Jesus was talking in the, what we talked about earlier. But the rabbis clearly taught that a worldwide conflict would signal the coming of the Messiah. A worldwide conflict would not signal that he has returned, but would signal the beginning of birth pangs. That's what it says in Matthew 24, 8. It's just that it's starting to happen. Have we had a worldwide conflict? Yeah, we did. What happened in the summer of 1914? Archduke Ferdinand was assassinated, and within 45 days the entire world was at, world, was at war. It was called World War I. Following the plan of Count Alfred von Schlieffen, who said the heart of France lies between Brussels and Paris, they attacked. And when the war was over with, four years later, the known dead per capita of population was one out of every 28 people in France was dead, one out of every 32 in Germany, one out of every 57 in England, and one out of every 107 in Russia. Of the combatants, just the combatants, nine million dead, 21 million wounded, and then civilian dead was 10 million on top of that. The result on top of this, just talking about this, this is the beginning of birth pangs, that's what it says. 
The Russian Empire collapsed and the Russian Revolution resulted. And then we had the Soviet Union and they, they actually killed more than World War I did. The Ottoman Turk Empire collapsed. The Austrian Hungarian Empire collapsed. The German Empire collapsed. The United States began to rise. And this is just the beginning of birth pangs, okay? That's just the beginning. Famines and earthquakes, yeah, at the end of World War I, this is a map of the area. And in black is in famine conditions immediately after World War I. The crosshatches are those areas that, well, basically, if you look at that, everybody's got a famine going on in one form or another at the end of World War I. Because they were too busy fighting the war, they didn't ha- and they didn't have enough people to plant crops anymore. So it became a problem. The British decided to blockade Lebanon during the war. They, kill- they starved out 200,000 people alone just with that. And the Great Famine of 1917 to 1919 in Iran killed 40% of the population. And this is the beginning of birth pangs. It's just the beginning. Lives that over the, since then that have been deliberately extinguished by politically motivated carnage is between 167 million to 175 million, and it's increasing every day. War dead, 87.5 million. Military war dead, 33.5 million. Civilian war dead, 54 million. People who have just been killed for one reason or another, not connected with the war, over 80 million. And the communists account for 60 million on their own. Earthquakes, you think they're increasing? That's a chart showing the relative number of earthquakes since 1973. It has increased. That's through 2006. Between 1986 and 1996, a period of 11 years, there were 15 earthquakes listed by the USGS of a magnitude 7.0 or greater. But between 1997 and 2007, a period of 11 years, there were 99 earthquakes with a magnitude of 7.0 or greater. And we've had over 10 of them in the last year. It's getting worse, not better. Birth pangs. Verse 20, chapter 24, verse 8 these things are merely the beginning of birth, came, birth pangs, the first sign of the end of the age. There are 12 signs that we see in the scriptures. World War I was in Matthew 24, 7. We're going to get to the regathering of Israel in Ezekiel 36 and 37. What we're seeing that Ezekiel's talking about talks to us today. The rise of Russia and her allies, Ezekiel 38. An increase in travel and knowledge, Daniel chapter 12, verse 4 capital and labor conflicts. We see that in James 5, verses 1 to 6. Scoffers? Yeah, I got a lot of those. 2 Peter 3, 1 and 2. Moral breakdown in society? We don't see that anywhere around at all. 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5. It, that is happening. A rise in lawlessness is predicted in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. An increase in occultism and cults in 1 Timothy 4. Apostasy in 1 Timothy 4 as well a rise of the ecumenical church in Revelation 17, and a one-world government in Daniel 2. And of course, we've already had the super sign of Christ's imminent return. Israel is back in the land. And we saw some pictures earlier this, of how they're reforesting areas that never had anything growing in it, at least in our memory. Out of everything that ended or started with World War I, World War I was the beginning point. By the way, the massive number of years of drought, 1900 years of drought, began to end in World War I, and normal rainfall began in 1946. That's interesting. Jews returned to, be, returned to the land, and as a result, uh, because of World War I, that was part of it. Uh, just as Ezekiel is discussing the coming judgment here in chapter 21, he shows agreement with what God is doing and how he is doing it. We see this, and it's horrible when you take a look at it, but that's God moving, God showing that he is going to come back in the person of Jesus Christ, and he's going to judge this world. But he's going to take us first. We're so glad you tuned into today's edition of The Unsafe Bible with Pastor Ken. For more information about this ministry and what we believe, you can find all you need to know at theunsafebible.com. Want to hear more messages from Ezekiel? We've got that too. Just look under the media tab. Again, our website is theunsafebible.com. As you've been listening to this teaching in Ezekiel, what are some of the things that come to mind? Do you struggle with unresolved sins in your life? Have you found yourself wondering why your life isn't going as planned? Can you imagine what it would be like to be exiled from paradise and to be told it was all your fault? That's the truth that Ezekiel had to deliver to the Jews from Babylon. 
It took 70 years, but they finally accepted their sin as their own and returned in faith to God. Where are you on that journey? No matter what the circumstances are, you must seek God in all things to ensure a singular focus on the one true God. We want you to find strength in your faith. And if you need help or have questions, you can contact us directly at theunsafebible.com. Just click on the Connect tab and the Connect card. Fill it out and we'll get in touch with you. If you're in the Jupiter, Florida area, we want to invite you to our next worship service. Directions can be found on the About tab by clicking the word Contact. We hope to see you soon. Well, that's all the time we have for today. But we want to invite you back again next for more encouraging and uplifting messages by Pastor Ken right here on The Unsafe Bible.